afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. City Club is where civic-minded people come together to make Portland and Oregon a better place for everyone to live, work, and play. I'm Greg McPherson, President of City Club. Members and guests are gathered today at the Sentinel Hotel along with all of you listening on OPB radio or watching on Portland Community Media. The generous support of City Club's corporate and media partners enables us to put on the state's best civic programs week after week. Our media partner is Oregon Business Magazine. Our current Friday Forum sponsors are Echo Northwest, Chevron, Girding Edlin, Morell Inc., Northwest Natural, and Schwabi Williamson and Wyatt. Please join me in showing our appreciation for all of them. It's Pride Month, and City Club is joining the celebration and conversation. Join us next Tuesday at Mint 820 for our third annual Pride Civic Drinks, one of our monthly networking events. Next week's Friday Forum is the State of the County address with Multnomah County Chair Deborah Kafuri. The lunch tickets for this event have been sold out for some time. However, a limited number of general admission tickets will be released for City Club members only next Tuesday, July 9th at noon. If you don't have a general admission ticket or a lunch ticket, we will not have any room for you to join us in person. We have opened up our live stream to everyone, and you can watch the program by going to www.pdxcityclub.org slash live. At our Friday Forum on June 19th, we will hear from local and national leaders about the stories and barriers affecting people who are transgender. You can learn more about City Club events, purchase tickets, and become a member on our website, pdxcityclub.org. As always, we will be live tweeting today's program. You can follow along and join the conversation using the hashtag PDXCityClub. Later in our program, Mitchell Hartman will, be, will facilitate a Q&A session with today's speaker and those in the audience. Asking questions at the City Club microphone is a privilege of membership, but anyone in the audience here at the Sentinel may write a question on one of the index cards found at the center of the tables. Hold your cards up high and City Club staff will collect them before or during the Q&A session. And now for today's program. Many countries are finding that multinational corporations are avoiding taxes in the countries in which they do business. Efforts are underway to collect tax revenue from such corporations, but this requires cooperation among countries rather than competition to attract corporate operations. Such cooperation and the requisite changes in tax law are hard to accomplish. Our speaker on these issues, Floyd Norris, is recently retired from the position of Chief Financial Correspondent for the New York Times. He has spent a long career in business jur journalism, including stints with the Associated Press and Barron's Weekly before joining the Times. And he let me know uh, earlier today that this was probably not his first visit to Portland. Uh, the, the one prior visit occurring in the early 1960s when his family drove from Los Angeles to the Seattle World's Fair. And he, he regards it as highly probable that he uh, uh, traversed through Oregon and uh, through Portland, although he, he did not retain a specific memory of that event. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to, to express our appreciation to longtime club member um, Portland City Commissioner Steve Novick for making the arrangements for today's presentation. Uh, moderating today's conversation is Mitchell Hartman, senior reporter for entrepreneurship with Marketplace Radio. Please join me in welcoming today's guests to Friday Forum. Thank you, Greg. It's, it's a kind introduction. I appreciate it. It's, it's a real honor for me to be at the City Club in Portland. Um, I have friends who live in Oregon, and I told them I was coming out, and they said, that's nice. And then I told them what I was going to do, and they were impressed, so I, was, I appreciate it. My friend Nick Kristoff at the Times has been telling me to come to Oregon for years, that it was a wonderful state, and he couldn't understand why I didn't visit. So I am. I'm going to go. My wife and I are going to be going on vacation here starting um, when this is over, and we'll be visiting, among other things, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, which Nick and was one of the things he told me to do. I suspect there are some people here in the audience 
who bristled when they saw the title that I put on this speech, The Corporate Tax Illusion. They may have muttered that the tax bill their company pays is very real and perhaps rather painful. And they may be right. Corporate tax receipts, income tax receipts in this country, now total a little more than 2% of GDP. That's the size of the whole economy. That's up a little from a few years ago when the recession was on, but it's far below the level of, of, a cent of half a century ago. Nonetheless, it's real money. It fascinates me that the United States figure on the share of economy that goes to corporate income taxes is smaller than almost any other major economy. As a share of national income, corporate income taxes produce more money in Ireland, a country that is well known for its low corporate tax rates and that will come up later as I discuss some specific games companies play. For most corporate income, the Irish have a stated corporate rate of 12.5%. That's not much more than a third of the rate that we claim to have in the United States. So how does the United States manage to have a high corporate rate and a low corporate tax collection? That's basically the subject of this speech. One answer can be found in the words attributed to the late Leona Helmsley, the wealthy New York hotel executive who went to prison for tax evasion. Her former housekeeper quoted her as saying, quote, only the little people pay taxes. She denied saying that, and I obviously don't know whether she really did, but it is a sentiment that an awful lot of executives of major multinational corporations could share. I want to talk to you about how companies manage to do that and about what the United States and other countries are starting to do and what they could do to create a system that does not gouge some companies, generally smaller ones, but does force the richest companies to pay more than they do now. Before I start, I'm going to tell you a few simple, well, relatively simple things about that you need to understand about corporate income taxes. The complexity of the system is one of the things that I think has facilitated companies getting away with what they do. It's very hard to understand. People don't. And in addition, disclosures are often very poor. Um, Clearly, our system used to be more reasonable because almost all companies did business in one country. In that case, it's pretty easy in some ways. Um, but of course, they don't anymore. A country's corporate tax system can take one of two basic forms. Um, one is to have a global tax, where you, the companies that are are reside in your country, you tax them on all of their income everywhere. With credits, of course, for money they actually paid in taxes to other countries. Or you can have a territorial system where you tax all companies based on the profits they make in your country, whether they're based in your country or not, and you ignore profits learned overseas. We claim to have a global system, but we don't actually tax quote, foreign profits until they are brought home. The result is that companies build up huge cash hoards on which they are never taxed because they say they earn the money overseas and have not brought the money home. Um, there are ways for strictly domestic companies to, to reduce their income taxes, but they can't shelter the taxes indefinitely as international companies can do. Um, and that, I think, matters a lot. Over one recent three-year period, according to a Senate committee that did incredible work on this, 30 major U.S. multinationals earned a total of $160 billion in profits over those three years. They paid the United States government a total of zero dollars in taxes. I'm going to focus today on three large companies, Apple, Caterpillar, and Starbucks. I'm looking at them not because I think they're particularly unusual, 
but because they have been well studied by government investigators and the results of those investigations made public, either here or in one case in Europe. And I'm going to look at something that strikes me as highly interesting and try to discuss what it might mean. That is the outrage that was seen in Europe over disclosures on a number of co companies, particularly Starbucks, but also Google and some others. Starbucks, it seems, um, has been very successful in Britain, but, doesn't, but hasn't until recently paid any taxes there. And I want to contrast that to the much milder reaction we saw to the disclosures in this country, especially among some Republican senators, about the tax avoidance strategies that companies use here. When I first started looking at corporate income taxes, I assumed it was not hard to figure out where a company earned its money. You could look to sales. If they sell something in, company, in country X, well, they earned the money in company X. Or maybe if they made the product in one country and sold it in another, you ought to split the, products and the profits in some way between those two countries. But it's not nearly so simple, especially but not exclusively in the technology business. What companies do is put the patents and other intellectual properties they own in a subsidiary that they own, which is at least nominally located in a country with a very low tax rate. Um, this, sometimes they put, they put the, subsi the, the subsidiary in, in well-known tax havens, such as the Cayman Islands or Bahamas, but that is not always necessary. Sometimes major countries will negotiate sp special deals to have the business put in their country. Those deals are kept secret from competitors and they're kept secret from other countries. Apple is the poster giant of tax, evasion, tax avoidance. Companies get very upset if you say tax evasion because that's a crime and they're not committing crimes they want you to know. We learned from Senate hearings a couple of years ago that Apple has something that has become known as stateless income. It has a subsidiary that under United States tax law is Irish. Therefore, the US says, only Ireland can tax it until the profits are brought home. Under Irish tax law, that subsidiary is an American company and not subject to Irish taxation. Now, in reality, that subsidiary barely exists. My definition of reality includes number of people working for it and things like that. But on its tax, but according to Apple, it is a phenomenally profitable company. It gets the lion's share of Apple's profits in Europe and Asia because Apple arranges intercompany transfers to say that is what's happening. One um, tax professor said that it was as if Apple checked a box to elect out of the worldwide taxation on a vast swath of its international income. And yet, Apple did not do all it could have done. It could have paid less in taxes in the United States if it had chosen to move a big part of its United States profits to that stateless shell company. Tim Cook, Apple's chief executive, told the Senate that the company pays a rate of more than 30% on its U.S. profits. We do have a low tax rate outside the U.S., he admitted, but this is for profits we sell outside the U.S. I had an experience with Apple a few years ago that makes me wonder about even how accurate that is. I called Apple on their 800 number in the U.S. and ordered both a laptop computer and some other things including assurance against breaking the computer. It was for my son, who was then a college student and was not necessarily the, the most responsible person in holding such things. Um, I thought it was one transaction, but when my credit card bill arrived, it had been cut into two transactions. The computer was one transaction. All the other stuff was the second transaction. It added up to the same amount, so that was unimportant for me. When the computer arrived by, via UPS, it had been shipped directly to me from China. 
Apple US never touched that computer, and I suspect it booked little, if any, of the profits, even though I ordered it in the United States by calling an Apple employee whom I believed was in the United States. So when Apple says this would, they pay, ta don't pay taxes on their US profits, I have a suspicion their de definition of US profits is a fairly restrained one. For Apple shareholders, of course, it doesn't matter. Wherever the company books profits are the company's profits. But the tax code assumes that a subsidiary is based wherever the company says it is based. And it is a separate company. That makes it possible for a company such as Apple to structure intricate intercompany transactions in order to book the profits wherever it wishes to do so. Those transactions between the two subsidiaries are supposed to be negotiated on what they call an arm's length, arm's length basis. And what that means, of course, is they're supposed to be the same kind of terms they might negotiate with an independent company. But of course, that's almost impossible to enforce. The major asset of Apple, as of so many technology companies, is its intellectual property, its patents. So the parent has the US units sell the patents to a tax haven subsidiary at a very low price. Or the parent simply invests money, if it plans it early enough, they, the parent puts money into a, of the foreign subsidiary, and the foreign subsidiary then pays for the research, meaning that the foreign subsidiary owns what results and therefore is entitled to the profits. Um, it's all, of course, a great fiction. Sometimes there are a bunch of foreign subsidiaries taking advantage of differing tax laws and tax treaties between companies. So profits and sales and revenues are shuffled among them in wondrous ways. Um, Google got a lot of fame in Europe using something they called a double Irish Dutch sandwich, which involved moving profits from Ireland to Holland and back to Ireland, which somehow basically eliminated profits, at least for the tax books. Obviously, this is best for a tech company that has, or intellectual property is, is generating most of its revenue and profits. But you don't need to be a tech company. And that is one of the fascinating discoveries for me of recent years. That brings me to Caterpillar, the farm and construction equipment company. It has a disadvantage, and the disadvantage is that it's been around since 1925. And so when it established its corporate structure, it didn't have clever tax people helping it figure out what to do, as Apple and any other technology company now does. But in 1999, Apple restructured. They were helped along by PricewaterhouseCoopers, which both audits their books, including, I might note, assuring that their tax statement on their financial statements is, is, is reasonable, and it plans the tax strategy. Their strategy, in the end, Pricewaterhouse got paid tens of millions of dollars for this advice, but in the end, it didn't look like it required a lot of effort. Basically, they printed up some new stationery. So the bills came from a company allegedly based in Switzerland, not based in the United States. And therefore, of course, the profits should be in Switzerland. It turns out, I didn't know this, maybe some of you did, that the profits at Caterpillar generally don't come from selling tractors to farmers. There's competition in that business. There are other companies that make perfectly good tractors. And obviously, price is one of the ways that there is competition in that business. The profits come from the spare parts, from the replacement parts. After you buy a Caterpillar tractor, if something needs to be repaired or replaced, there's no place else to go. You're not going to get a replacement part from one of their competitors. Many of those parts are made in the United States and shipped to dealers and customers around the world. Before 1999, when Caterpillar sold a part to a dealer or a customer in, say, Canada or France, 
it booked the profits in the United States, where the, where the part was made, where it was coming from, but no more. Now those parts were listed as having been sold by a Swiss subsidiary. In reality, as I say, that amounted to printing up some new invoices that put the name of the Swiss subsidiary at the top instead of the name of Caterpillar US. So now if a farmer in Canada buys a part, it is shipped from the United States to Canada, and the profits are booked in Switzerland, even though the part never came within 1,000 miles of Switzerland. As part of the arrangement, CAT negotiated a special deal with Switzerland to tax those profits at a rate of 4 to 6 percent, far below the normal tax rate in, Swi in, in Switzerland. For the Swiss, of course, it was a sweet deal because they were getting a small cut of a pie that they would have gotten no cut of before. So that was good for them. And other countries had no way of knowing this was happening. The only reason we know was the wonderful work done by the Senate subcommittee um, that really went into Caterpillar's tax books. Now, is that a legal strategy? The answer is it may well not be. The Senate committee had a bunch of professors they consulted, and they tended to agree that it wasn't legal. The Caterpillar had a, found a professor who said, yeah, he thought it was legal. But the IRS, which is underfunded, did, apparently did not choose to challenge it. I say apparently, by the way, because of course, we don't know what the IRS does unless and until it hits court. Um, just as you have no way of knowing whether my tax returns were audited unless it ends up in court somehow. And the only way it's going to end up in court is if I appeal or if somebody charges me with a crime. The Senate investigators, however, they had subpoenas. And they found inter in internal memos at CAT indicating they were worried about whether this, this strategy was legal. And they adjusted it in ways that reduced the tax benefits but arguably made it less likely to be challenged. Had the, ch had the strategy been challenged, had it been ruled illegal, the reason almost certainly would have been that the company so clearly made the change for tax reasons, not for business reasons. Had CAT been a young company that started off with such a structure, almost certainly it would be legal. Perhaps the most impressive story of tax avoidance that has come out in the last few years, though, is Starbucks, a company that you passed on your way in. Perhaps you had a cup of coffee before you came upstairs. It, it has what you might think is a pretty humdrum business. Um, part of its success, not all of it, part of its success comes from a strategy that is available to lots of companies which is the old-fashioned method of defining words to mean in what I call the Humpty Dumpty manner. That's a reference to a book that I'm sure many of you read, possibly your children, um, in Through the Looking Glass, which was a, a sequel to Alice in Wonderland. Lewis Carroll has Humpty Dumpty tell Alice in what Carroll says is a rather scornful tone. When I use a word, it means what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. Alice is appalled by this. The question, she tells Humpty, is whether you can make words mean so many different things. To which Humpty replies, the question is which is the master, that's all. In this case, the word is manufacturing. There's a tax break available for domestic manufacturers, and it turns out Starbucks is a domestic manufacturer. What do they manufacture? They manufacture roasted coffee beans. They start with coffee beans, and they roast them, and that is somehow manufacturing. Um, another company I stumbled across, Open Table, which is a company that lets you make restaurant reservations. I suspect some of you have used it. I certainly have. They also got themselves classified as a manufacturer. I have no idea how. <laughs> but it got them a tax break. But what Starbucks did that got itself famous, really famous or infamous in several European countries, particularly Britain, was its clever strategy to move pr profits to where taxes were low or non-existent. 
This kicked up a big controversy in Britain. There were pickets, there were boycotts, there was a parliamentary investigation. It seems that while Starbucks has gained a very strong position in the United Kingdom, and while it has bragged to shareholders about its strong earnings there, it's told British tax officials it loses a lot of money year after year. According to the tax returns, which of course the parliament drug up, dug up, in, in, in Starbucks' first 15 years in Britain, it lost money in 14 of them. And it did this by siphoning the profits away. Coffee, which of course is not grown in any of these countries, is purchased by a Swiss subsidiary of Starbucks. It then marks the coffee up 20% and sells it to another Swiss subsidiary. That subsidiary roasts the coffee and sells it, of course, at a markup to the British subsidiary. The British stores get to pay additional royalties for the right to use the Starbucks name. Add all those up, and it turns out Starbucks is hopelessly unable to make money in Britain. It was promptly prompt pointed out that there's a British company that is, is, is competing with Starbucks, and they pay a lot of British taxes. Some people thought that was a little unfair. And because Britain, as you know, has been undergoing austerity for several years, slashing public spending to reduce budget deficits, it was easy to make the case that if Starbucks paid more, some public spending on things like schools perhaps could be restored. What fascinates me is that the uproar was so loud that Starbucks caved. It promised to pay Britain about $17 million in taxes in both 2013 and 2014, whether it owed the money or not. And then it announced plans to move its European headquarters to London. It's not clear what that does in to produce profits, but perhaps it helps. Nothing remotely like that has happened in the United States. And I think it is interesting to ask why. In this country, there is a widespread attitude that getting out of paying taxes, legally, of course, is to be applauded. During the Senate hearings, some Republican senators suggested that Caterpillar and Apple would have been violating their fiduciary duties to shareholders had they not minimized taxes. Of course, it turns out they didn't completely minimize them, according to their own records. They did leave some taxes away, but the, the senators didn't complain about that. Um, if, you, if an American farmer buys a spare part from Caterpillar, Caterpillar U.S. does pay the taxes. They don't claim that was sold through Switzerland, though it's not clear to me they couldn't. Senator Rand Paul, the, the Kentucky Republican who is now running for president and obviously has been in the news um, for surveillance reasons recently, apologized both to Caterpillar and to Apple executives for the fact that senators were even questioning them. I think, he said, that rather than having an inquisition, we should probably bring P Caterpillar in here and give them an award. He went on to say something that I, that I think is absolutely correct, but not necessarily in the way he meant it. The problem, he said, is in the tax code. To the, to the senator, the problem was that the corporate tax rate is so high. Why don't we lower the corporate tax rate, rate if we want businesses to stay here? What that ignores, it seems to me, is that Caterpillar had not moved its actual operations overseas. It simply shuffled papers so that it could tell the IRS it had done so. Lowering the tax rate, the corporate tax rate, in and of itself will accomplish virtually nothing. Because no matter how low a tax rate the U.S. adopts, zero is going to be better. And the company, the tax code lets companies like Apple get away with having a large part of its profits taxed at a zero rate. And of course, it's no accident that the tax code contains so many provisions that benefit specific industries or specific companies or that make it possible to hide profits away in tax havens. Companies spend a lot of money on lobbyists, not to mention campaign contributions. 
they get tax loopholes enacted, and then they say you can't expect them to pay more than they owe. Of the corporate stories I've discussed a little bit today, I think Starbucks is the most disturbing. If only a company like Apple, whose entire profits are based on its technology and its innovation, if they could only hide profits, if only they, they were the only one who could hide profits away, it might not really matter that much because there aren't that many companies like them. But Ed Kleinbard, who used to be the chief of staff of the Congressional Joint Committee on Taxation and now teaches tax law at the University of Southern California, pointed out that if Starbucks can organize itself as a, as a successful stateless income generator, any multinational company can do so. As he pointed out, Starbucks is a classic retailer. They operate stores in many high-tax jurisdictions around the world. But it enjoys a much lower overall tax rate than would be expected from looking at the average rates of areas where it does business. You may have heard about the great disadvantage all this leaves American companies in, which is they theoretically have to keep the profits overseas. If they bring them home, they'll have to pay U.S. taxes of 35% less whatever they paid overseas. That has led Apple, which has literally billions of dollars in cash, to borrow, to borrow money that they use to buy back stock because hedge funds wanted to cash out. It can't spend all of its untaxed profits to do that. But keeping the cash overseas doesn't mean what it sounds like. In Apple's case, its overseas money is managed by a subsidiary located in Nevada. It is tracked by Apple bookkeepers in Texas, and the funds are deposited at banks in New York. How is that money overseas? Well, those New York bank accounts say that the money is owned by Apple's Swiss subsidiaries. Therefore, it's overseas money. To hear the multinationals tell it, the scandal is that Apple cannot use the money for anything it wants to without paying taxes. They say the United States should lower the tax rate and end all taxation of overseas profits. But without putting some limitations on the ability of companies to move profits around, that would accomplish, accomplish little except to over, lower the overall tax collections, largely by reducing taxes on domestic companies. It would do nothing to reduce the relative tax burden on the rest of us, and nothing to lower the budget deficit. So what are we going to do about this? What should we do about this? Some things seem obvious to me. The first is that companies must be requ required to report their entire international tax position to their home countries and to countries in which they do substantial business. Starbucks, even while admitting it had transferred all those profits to the Netherlands, um, refused to tell the British how much taxes it paid on those profits. It said that the Dutch required secrecy, to which the Dutch government responds, hey, no, we don't require secrecy. You can say anything you want. But they still didn't say. Um, with government knowing what deals other governments were making, they would be in a better position to put pressure on tax havens, including countries like Ireland, and to perhaps force companies to pay anyway. A solution in this country will have to involve a lower corporate tax rate. We do need to reduce the tax rate. But it should be accompanied by reforms that prevent the companies from hiding their profits. It must eliminate many of the deductions and loopholes that keep companies from paying anything close to the stated rate. In tax jargon, that means increasing the base on which taxes are levied. There is an organization, some of you have probably heard of it, called the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. It's basically, it started off as the rich clubs, rich countries club. It's since expanded to include a few countries that wish they were rich or close to getting rich. But it still is basically what it began with. And that group is working on a system on a series of initiatives under the wonderfully wonky title of BEPS, which stands for Base Erosion and Profit Sharing. The OECD has announced some very good principles. Multinationals would have to disclose 
to every country where they did business, a country-by-country -country breakdown of sales, taxes, and other measures of economic activities, including the number of employees. I think those disclosures, if they became public, would be a wonder to read. Um, some years ago, I visited a relative who I think was the only person in the Bahamas who was then working for a certain large U.S. multinational oil company. He had previously worked in such places as Alaska and Oklahoma, and now, but now he was living on Paradise Island. He had a rented house across the street from the marina where his boat was docked. We had a great time visiting him. As near as I could tell, my relative's job was to shuffle papers involving the company's Bahamian subsidiary, where it was booking a lot of profits despite the fact that it did not produce, it did not refine, it did not sell any products in the country. The OECD says it's, it's making progress on all this, and if any of you are so fascinated you'd like to learn more, tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Portland time, they're having a telephone conference call to discuss their progress, and you can listen in. I wish the OECD well but I wonder if it can possibly succeed. Um, we need, I think, to change an attitude among Americans to one that says those who love our country should want to help support it, and that those who manage to avoid doing that are to be criticized, not praised. Um, that concludes what I have to say. Basically, I thank you for your time, and I'll be happy to talk to Mitchell. Floyd, thank you so much. Uh, fascinating, irritating, and fascinating. Um, uh, I have to first just say I'm, I'm honored to be up here uh, with Floyd. I've got to confess to a bit of journalistic occupational envy. I grew up in the New York area. Um, I always wanted to uh, play for the New York Philharmonic, play for the New York Mets, uh, which was never going to happen, and write for the New York Times. This is as close as I get. So um, I'll try asking questions as if uh, I was working for the New York Times. Um, let me start with this question. The kinds of tax evasion, avoidance, uh, deception, whatever we want to call it, that you're describing uh, sounds bad, uh, especially from the perspective of these companies as corporate citizens. And yet, I wonder really who is losing out. There's a, an argument that could be made that uh, reducing your taxes by whatever means necessary is uh, at least legitimate, if not um, a mitzvah almost, um, less money for Uncle Sam, uh, more money for the business to reinvest or give to shareholders or uh, create jobs. Um, it, could it be argued that it's almost a victimless crime? I don't think so. Um seems to me the way we should look at taxes in this country, and, and few people do, is that the government, governments, plural, have to raise money through taxes to finance their operations. You can certainly have an argument over whether a certain operation of government, a certain program deserves to be expanded or cut. But at some point, we reach a decision that says the government is going to spend X dollars then it's got to raise the money. And we need to have an attitude which says that if somebody gets a tax break, that means that other somebodies are going to have to pay more. The corporate tax rate would be far lower, the individual tax rate would be far lower, and still collect the same amount of money if we, had a, if we didn't have all of these deductions, credits, write-offs, loopholes, whatever you want to call them, available. And I think we need to look at it simply from the theory that if you manage to avoid taxes with a gamut that I can't use, that simply means for the government to raise the same amount of money, it's going to have to force me to pay a little more. So it's not a victimless crime. It seems like it may, however, be a crime that we can uh, never really 
fight effectively enough to make it worth it. Um, if you think of it as a sort of a financial arms race, um, and I've read you know, some of uh, what you and others have written, the IRS is hopelessly uh, outgunned, outmanned, um, and will probably always be. Um, there will always be a way to get around the next rule. Um, might it not simply be better to lower corporate taxes across the board, make sure everyone pays that which you uh, want, and move on from there? I, I certainly agree we should lower corporate tax rates across the board and make sure people pay. That means getting at the things. That defeatist attitude, though, it seems to me is a little bit like asserting that people are going to speed, which they are. Therefore, the police should not stop speeders, because they're certainly not going to catch all of them. The IRS doesn't have to be so underfunded. It's underfunded because Congress underfunds it. And a lot of people in Congress think you, they can make political gains out of that. Um, some government agencies have a warm and fuzzy public image. The IRS will never have such an image. <laughs> For certain. Um, but I don't, um, you know, I think something needs to try to be done. Obviously, it's not perfect. But one of the things I think we should all remember is that for most of us individuals, tax avoidance is very, very difficult. The government knows how much I was paid last year by the New York Times. They sent them a report. My other principal source of income was, was financial institutions that set what are called Form 1099s showing how much interest I earned, showing how much I got when I sold a security I might own. So had I wanted to cheat, what could I have done? Well, I could have claimed my basis was higher on some things that I sold so I owed less in capital gains taxes. I could have invented some non-existent deductions. I could have claimed I gave lots of money to charity that I didn't give. And if the IRS didn't audit me, I might well get away with that. But I wouldn't have saved that much money doing it. The, the potential for most of us, and that's one of the things that makes it so incredibly unfair, I think, the potential for most of us to do that simply isn't there, or as the potential is there for multinational companies. Um, who do you blame for the, the egregious and outrageous situation that you're describing? Um, would you want or expect the companies themselves to simply um, come clean and you know, file more honest taxes? Would you expect the, the accounting firms that do that work to uh, be a little less creative? Or would you put the... Uh, blame perhaps just at Congress for not doing anything about it or passing these laws in the first place? Well, certainly Congress, in, in one sense, has the blame. And there is a sense in which you shouldn't blame companies for taking advantage of whatever laws they can take advantage of. But I think other things can be done. Figuring out, you may have noticed that the companies I described were companies where we'd had really comprehensive government investigations. Those of you who have ever looked at a corporate annual report, and I suspect many of you have, know there's an income tax line on the income statement. Looking at that for a public company, and, and, and virtually all major country, companies in this country are public, you might think, well, that's really easy to do. But it turns out that doesn't tell you very much. And what disclosures are required, companies find ways around. There is a wonderful disclosure required that for companies that have recorded excess profits, that have recorded overseas profits, they have to put down how much it would cost them in taxes if they brought all of that money home. Well, they don't have to. They're supposed to. Companies can assert that it's simply beyond their abilities to compute that number, and therefore they don't have to disclose it. And the vast majority of them do assert they can't compute it. Um, Microsoft, by the way, is one that does say they can compute it and does disclose it, which, as does Apple, which I think is nice. Of course, you know, if you claim you can't operate a decent computer program at Microsoft, there's a, you know, there's, there's a possible public image problem. 
I'm going to exert a, a prerogative from the podium. Um, City Club members are the only people who are allowed to ask questions, but my father, who is not a City Club member, is in the audience. He's a uh, former um, uh, C almost of a Fortune 500 company, as, and as I was talking to him this morning over breakfast, he wanted me to ask this question, so I give it to you. Um, given the increasing sophistication of um, international business and the fact that it is e easier and easier to headquarter a company not in Cupertino or Seattle or New York or whatever. Um, if we do actually eliminate the loopholes, make it much more difficult to shift this kind of money around, um, how great is the danger, do you think, that major corporations will you know, do what we've been hearing about, inversions, simply move their headquarters? And if they do, do we care? Um, inversions currently can be a problem. It's hard for an, ex for an established company to do an inversion because when they do it, they're supposed to pay taxes on all those previously gained profits. I think the answer is for the world to go to some kind of a system based on genuine national profits so that Starbucks, which is not headquartered in Britain, pays profits on, the, on what they actually earn pays taxes, what they actually earn in Britain. And whether or not some company decides to claim its headquarters is Bermuda or, or Switzerland, they will pay profits to the United States on business they genuinely do in, in, in the United States. And there will be enough disclosure available to all countries where it does business that they can calculate this. Sure, there's possibly going to be an argument between countries which says, you know, I think I should get 20% of the profits. The other country says, no, you should get 15. But the winner of that argument is going to be, you know, we'll collect some taxes. The loser will also. I think that's, in the end, has to be the answer. Otherwise, we're basically saying that international companies simply are not subject to any kind of national regulation. Right, they're sort of... Uh supranational, in essence, yes. entities. Um, however, uh, we can't even get uh, Oregon, Washington, and California not to poach each other's businesses and, you know, game the tax differentials. Um, certainly, you know, we fight with South Carolina to get Boeing plants. Um, getting states to agree not to, to level the playing field is incredibly difficult. How about nations? Well, and of course, the state fight often involves granting tax credits so that you got that company to, to locate in your state, often by forgiving them lots of taxes, often by giving them money in addition to the profits they might have, taxes they might have paid, on the theory that they're going to hire people. Um, and that's been going on you know, longer than you and I have been around and will continue to. Um, it's you know, I don't have good solutions for all these things. But, you know, one system, a really simple thing. Now, Obama proposed a fairly simple idea. Um, his proposals, of course, have as much chance of being accepted in Congress, you know, as I have of making the Olympic track team. But, um, you know, he suggested that we lower the corporate tax rate and say that companies will pay ta that rate on their worldwide profits each year, less the taxes they actually paid somewhere else. Simple. You want to claim you earned the profits in, in, in Switzerland or Ireland? Good. Tell me how much you paid the Swiss or Irish in taxes, and that will reduce your tax bill. Otherwise, you're paying it. So you're going to pay the taxes somewhere. And that's, um, it, it is, of course, not as simple as that, but it, it would be nice to have something like that tried. <laughs> In Switzerland, it's certainly not going to be that easy. I, I note that uh, FIFA is based in Switzerland. And I heard on the news this morning that part of the South American Soccer Federation is based in a part of Paraguay that is actually not Paraguay, nor is it anything. It's a stateless entity, which is where they put part of FIFA. Um, they, they're not even subject to the country's laws. But let's stick with the state uh, issue for a minute. Um, these same multinational corporations, we have several major ones in, in Oregon, uh, major employers, major generators of profit, Nike, Intel, Facebook. Um, how do we see the things that you're talking about playing out at a state level? Um, 
I, I would assume once you accomplished what I suggested on a federal basis, so that we have concluded that XYZ company earned 30% of its profits in the US and that amounts to you know, $100 million, numbers I'm obviously pulling out of the air, then there could be some kind of similar allocation among states where the company did business. And rules to allocate it could be worked out and um, applied. Um, I think that, that happens after you do the, um, mm -hmm. the first part. I'm, I'm wondering if you see, um, and it, th th this may not be something that, that you know in detail enough, but whether you see in states like Oregon those same companies um, you know, paying much less in corporate income tax on their income than they ought to. I don't know. Um, I certainly know in some, in some states I have looked at, which does not include Oregon, states have often have sometimes exempted companies from paying state income taxes, often for many, many years. They've exempted companies from paying property taxes in return for companies becoming, having jobs there. One piece of research I've, I've wanted to do but never have, anybody who hears this and wants to do it, I'd urge you to do so, is when did we start calling companies job creators? It is a wonderful way to consider them um, so much better than employers um, or bosses or something. Um, and of course, companies don't, in a certain sense, create jobs. The economy creates jobs. Companies take advantage of the economy. They innovate, they compete, all good things. But, um, you know, if we have a depression, as it seemed like we might a few years ago, companies are going to have to lay people off. And that's that, 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 that destruction of jobs was not caused by the company, it was caused by the bad economy. Similarly, the creation of jobs is often caused by the good economy. We're going to move to the section where we uh, take questions from the audience. I've got a set of disclosures that I'm going to read very fast, uh, like they do on commercial radio. We're now going to open up to a Q&A portion of the program. If you have a written question on an index card, please hold it up high so that the City Club staff can collect it from you. We'll now take questions. As always, we invite members to the microphone to ask their question. Asking questions at the Friday Forum, microphone is a benefit of City Club membership, and membership is open to everyone. But I don't think you can join before we get through that line. Before asking your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member. Ask your question in 30 seconds or less. Also, I will read at least one index card question. And our first question comes from one of our civic scholars. If indeed we have a civic scholar, and if not, just a regular scholar will do. Ted Kay, City Club member, not civic scholar, but scholar, I guess. Um, a question for you. It seems that you're missing a huge piece of the taxation uh, uh, challenge here, that governments have two bites at the taxation apple on profits. Not only do they tax corporations on their profits, but they tax the shareholders when the shareholders receive dividends representing those profits. You've said nothing about that. The United States has ample opportunity to tax those dividends of the shareholders of those American companies. Uh, how do you reconcile that with your talking just about corporate profits? I am really glad you asked that. I, I considered discussing that in the speech. There were time limits. One problem with only taxing the shareholders, of course, is that many shareholders are not subject to U.S. taxation. Notably, of course, all the um, nonprofit organizations that own them, the pension funds, and, and in many cases, foreign foreigners. But there was a wonderful proposal proposed by President George W. Bush back in, I think, 2005 to deal with that. What he suggested was simple. He suggested that dividends would not be taxed so long as they came from profits that the company could show had been taxed. Corporate America was appalled. Um, not publicly, but, but privately. Um, 
imagine what would have happened if that had been enacted. You'd be sitting there considering whether to buy XYZ company that pays a lot of taxes or General Electric that pays virtually none. And you would know that your dividend from XYZ, you can keep your dividend from General Electric, you have to pay taxes on. Presumably that makes you more inclined to buy XYZ, obviously other factors considered. Um, you know, the Bush Treasury Department had not done a good job. They, they missed, you know, they hadn't prepared all the details well. Um, and Congress ended up with a solution that corporations proposed, which was forget about whether they'd pay taxes, just cut every dividend tax rate down to 15%, whether the company paid taxes on it or not, and that's what was done. I would, I'm all in favor of ending double taxation. Um, I'm just really sorry we don't have single taxation. <laughs> At least single taxation. I share your pain. My name's Chuck Sheketoff. I'm a City Club member and executive director of the Oregon Center for Public Policy. And I have a question about the media, given that you're both from the media and the role of the media in all this. In October of 1990, Fortune Magazine, in its listing of the 10 best cities for business in the United States, ranked St. Paul, Minneapolis number two. And they said, among other things, painfully high corporate and personal income taxes go for heavy expenditures on education, welfare, transportation, and parks. The system works. I'd like to know about your thoughts on the role of the media in allowing the discussion to change that the business climate isn't, you know, I believe the business climate is measured by the quality of public structures in our states and in our countries, which is why I think a lot of companies won't flee the United States for other countries. Um, and then also, and then how the media has been hampered by the lack of disclosure, that we don't have equal disclosure from the IRS that we have even from the SEC, as complicated as that is. I certainly would agree with you that um, sometimes the media has not done a great job on this. Often we've accepted the idea that, you know, low taxes are good, which obviously in a sense they are. It is very hard to learn these facts. I have tried. I have spent untold hours trying to figure out how much money com companies paid by going over public records and have been unsuccessful in most cases. That was not asking how much they should pay. It was not asking what games they had, play, they, had, they, had, they had been able to use to avoid paying. It was just how much did they pay. The disclosures that are available to the public, largely from the SEC, could be a lot better. Wynne Wakala, City Club oh, member. I, I'm sorry, I was gonna, I, I'm gonna just jump in to respond from a more general perspective, because I actually don't do that kind of you know, attempt to actually understand how they pay their taxes. I would agree that at a much more general level, there is sort of a civic religion in this country, and I think even very um, uh, balanced mainstream media uh, engage in it, which is that, uh, that we hate taxes. Um, I can't imagine leading up to April 15th, having the headline be, yay, it's almost tax day. I mean, we wouldn't do it. We, we don't trash a lot of things, but we trash taxes. Um, and we, uh, we do that, I think, because we think that everyone's going to agree with us. In, in reality, of course, for the vast majority of Americans, April 15th is a good day in the sense that it's refund day. Right. Wynne City Club member. Um, in the past, I was auditing supervisor for the City of Portland Bureau of Licenses and audited corporations and whatnot. Um, I know a big thing is figuring, figuring out apportionment. If we actually said apportionment was based on where the, where the buyers were, would that help us to figure out how much these companies should be paying us, especially if we could use the sales tax records from different states. Perhaps, that sounds reasonable to me, but I have no expertise in that detail, I'm sorry. I have even less, I confess. <laughs> but we'll, someone will research it for sure. I think we have one more question, and then I have a question from uh, here, and I think we'll... I'm sure people are already Two Googling it. Chris Andre, City Club member. Uh, this has been insightful and entertaining, and... Uh, is I applaud both of you. My question, though, is um, the cost of collection. You mentioned that 
lowering corporate tax rates overall across the board uh, and would would make it easier to collect uh, I don't see how I, I corporations can say oh it's a bit lower so here I'll just tell them, you know I'll write a check the cost too of collection how is that factored in Well, the cost, of course, is, is a cost borne by the IRS or by the state tax authorities, and it is not, um, you know, it's not done on the same arithmetic. And, of course, the cost of companies to comply can be very high. Um, some of you, I'm sure, pay accountants money that you think is an unreasonably high sum to, compute, to do your own income tax returns. Maybe, some of you may be accountants who think the, price, the amount you charge is too low. I don't know. It's um, obviously that's a, that's a consideration, and that's an argument for a less complicated tax system. We have run out of <clears throat> broadcast time for further questions, and we'll have to stop for the day. <clears throat> As we close, please join me in offering our sincere thanks to Floyd Norris and Mitchell Hartman. <clears throat>